Welcome. This week we continue in Matthew chapter 18 and I encourage you to read the whole chapter as if it were, indeed it is, instruction for the church. And so we're at the end of the chapter, the story that Jesus told that we've heard many times. It seems there was a man who owed so much that it was a debt worth 3,500 lifetimes of income. Just let that sink in. That's a lot of money. That's outrageous. And that's the point. Jesus is making this amount so large that everyone knows. First, no one would lend that much. And second, no one could pay that much. But that is our debt to God for our sin. It's beyond our ability to pay. And the king, in mercy, forgives such a large debt. It's like winning the billion-dollar lottery. Wow, how would we feel if we were given that much mercy? Well, this man goes out and finds a neighbor who owes him 30, excuse me, 90 days of income, three months. The man can't pay it immediately. And so the one who was given so much mercy throws his neighbor into debtor's prison. Now, when the king hears about this, he brings the man who was forgiven so much before him. And of course, we know the point of the story is because we have been forgiven so much, we must be forgiving because if we fail to forgive, we may receive the forgiveness we are only willing to give. Wow. What an important story. So I want to begin today's sermon by asking a question. How many of you enjoy fresh corn, steaming hot, dripping in butter, perfectly seasoned, and biting into those tender, sweet kernels? One summer, while I was serving in Oriental, a lady from our church brought a basket, and I'm talking a large basket filled with fresh corn from her family's farm to my office. Of course, it was more corn than I could possibly eat. And she told me a strange thing. Freeze the corn in the husk. Well, I'd never heard of this. I was reluctant to try it, but I did what she recommended because she was one of those dear elderly saints of the church whose experience, wisdom, and gentleness was appreciated. Well, at Thanksgiving there in Orlando, there were a group of us who didn't have family in town and didn't travel out of town for Thanksgiving, and we planned a meal together. And so I brought the frozen corn. We shucked it and steamed it. Much to my surprise, it tasted as if it was fresh from the cornfield. Now, have you ever roasted corn on the grill in the husk? Get those nice black burn marks. And when you peel back the husk, the steam just rolls off. What I was surprised the first time I roasted corn in the husk was the silks just fall off the corn. So now I ask you, have you ever eaten corn on the cob husk and all? Why not? Well, we know the husk is not good for consumption. And we don't need you to try it to prove that the husk is not delicious. Yet when it comes to scripture, at times people eat scripture, husk, silk, corn, and cob. 
Yes, we receive scripture like an ear of corn. The husks are the layers of culture that have been added over the years. The culture in which it was written. And the silks, those silks, well, they're the opinions that have been tangled and attached to the word. And that cob are those hardened things that we sometimes are not allowed to question. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Have you ever heard that? You know, in all my 65 years, I've never heard a church member say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, about selling all they have and giving to the poor. There's another example of why we need to interpret Scripture together. So let me be crystal clear. No one takes Scripture literally. Such an endeavor requires one to be an expert in ancient cultures, economies, histories, and religions, fluent in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Koine Greek. Then an English linguist able to understand the etymology and morphology of our current language. And if one could master all that, we would still have to break through the theological, cultural, partisan, political, and historical milieu of the current audience. Wow. But there's a better way. Take scripture seriously. Approach it with humility. Interpret it together as the church by following and learning from Jesus' example. That's what's at stake in the instruction in Matthew 18. The text for last Sunday and today. They remind us we're called to live in community. We need each other to grow in faith, to have life together that God desires for us. We need each other for the challenging task of interpreting scripture. The surest recipe for disaster is a person with a holy book, their own opinion, and an unwillingness to accept any other interpretation. We have seen that time and time again regardless of the religion. Scripture is always interpreted within our community of faith, the church. We need each other if we're ever going to truly understand Scripture. Scripture is a lived experience in community, thereby we interpret it together. As we encountered last week, we first do no harm by protecting new and vulnerable believers from those who do not live out the teachings of Jesus, who indeed do the opposite. Living in a manner unworthy of the gospel before impressionable new disciples is indeed, as Jesus showed us, deadly to their faith. That is why we second, we do all the good we can by examining ourselves first and our relationships within the church. Then when we discover there is one who has done harm, we go to them in humility to seek the healing of repentance, forgiveness, and repair. Unfortunately, since the time of the church in Corinth, or around 50-ish, until the the present, throughout these 2,000 years, there have been members in church communities so committed to their opinions and the power they hold that they refuse to listen to any corrective teaching of the church. The church has to become like the coach, benching the star player for failing to be a team player. The church indeed must bench those who do harm with their actions. But that's not the end of it according to Jesus. It's not problem solved. We have to stay in love with God and one another, traveling the hard road of unconditional forgiveness. Traverse the steep path of repentance, having our thoughts, our words, and behaviors completely transformed by Jesus' teachings. The goal of Matthew 18 is protection, repentance, and forgiveness to arrive at reconciliation. This is not papering over the issue, ignoring the harm so we can move on. 
Reconciliation requires the harm be named and the harm be owned, owning our part in it. The change of heart is turning our backs on the harmful behaviors, seeking forgiveness and doing what it takes for healing. This process takes time to foster genuine restoration and reconciliation. So how do we get there again? And again, it's humility. God has forgiven us a debt of sin we cannot repay if we had 3,500 3, lifetimes. Therefore, we approach the complex task of lasting forgiveness, repentance, and reconciliation because we have been forgiven so much. Our confirmants have confronted this issue. Did, just, did Jesus mean by turning the other cheek that we should allow ourselves to be continually abused? Of course not. Did Jesus mean by forgiving 490 times that the harmful behavior is to be ignored in the process? Of course not. Forgiveness and repenting are forgiveness and repentance are nothing without confronting harm and seeking complete healing and transformation. Jesus taught us by example that good theology is not a set of rules we memorize and follow. That process did not work for the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the scribes. It seems that when religion is about rules, religious people tend to find fault in others, rarely finding their own shortcomings. Jesus said something about that, didn't he? Don't try to remove the sawdust speck from your neighbor's eye when your own eye has a two by 10. Jesus taught us faith as a set of relationships. Love God with all our heart, mind, and spirit and love our neighbor as ourselves. What we're seeing in Hawaii, Libya, and Morocco after devastating calamities People are coming together, putting their differences aside for the sake of their community and for rebuilding their communities. Let's name that every church, including ours, regardless of their denomination, have been through a devastation that began with the COVID lockdown. No matter what we did, no matter why we did it, nerves were frayed and divisions erupted. It happened across the nation, not just here. Conversations about constitutional rights often got in the way of churches paying attention to our covenant promises to protect and care for one another, especially the vulnerable. In my short time as chaplain to the people who've been exiled from their home churches after disaffiliation, I have learned there is no good pathway in the disaffiliation process without harm. Whatever the conversation, however carefully it was handled, if it ended up in a vote of any kind, the body of Christ was fractured. People were left hurting. And all this happened layered over a decade of more of decline, not only in mainline churches, but in evangelical churches. Reminds me of Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address when he noted that Christians were bitterly divided over the war and slavery. This is what he said. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God. Each invokes God's aid against the other. It seems strange that any man would dare to ask God's assistance in wringing the bread, their own bread, from the sweat of other men's faces. People on both sides quoted scripture. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar. 
History has a way of repeating itself. And in this current reality, we're not alone. And it may be one of the healing paths that God has for us is right here in Matthew 18. To see Littleton and New Hope and Halifax as our brothers and sisters and reach out to them for support and to support, to offer care to one another. Could we learn from one another? Could we work together for a deeper healing? Matthew 18 is clear in naming the truth. We are on the road to healing. In our most recent church council meeting and in the meeting of the transition team that followed, I have seen and felt a new spirit, a calm, and a hopefulness for the future. And in the next two months, we can live into that spirit of hope. Next Sunday, homecoming, we can see this as a time to love one another, to hug some necks, to worship and break bread together in joy and thanksgiving, for God is indeed blessing us. October 1st, the following Sunday, World Communion Sunday, Remember, this work of God is bigger than we can imagine, bigger than we can do on our own because it encompasses the whole earth. And in that service, we will renew our confession of faith and renew our joy by confirming two young women as followers of Jesus Christ. In the ensuing weeks leading up to Advent, yes, just some 70 days away, we will encounter the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus' instruction for life together as the church. During this time, we'll have Bible studies and Sunday school classes unpacking scriptures on the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. Be part of this fellowship and learning together. There will be conversations on missions, making disciples, leadership, stewardship that support our calling to reach children and seniors with the love of Christ. We can join in those conversations for we will enter into Advent with all this good work to offer a gift. A gift to God our maker of a church more unified, more rooted in the teachings of Jesus, more empowered to show the love of God. And what better gift to give God at Christmas? than doing life together as disciples of Jesus, reaching out in love for one another and for our neighbor. This is the life together that Matthew 18 was written to guide, support, and make real so that the world will know we are Christians by our love made visible in words and in deeds. Because we have been forgiven so much, let us seek the gifts of repentance, forgiveness, and reconciliation that our love, our service, and our unity might be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go with this hope, go with this joy, go with this peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.